Chapter Six of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Mr. Hindley came home to the funeral, and a thing that amazed us and set the neighbors gossiping right and left. He brought a wife with him. What she was and where she was born, he never informed us. Probably she had neither money nor name to recommend her, or he would scarcely have kept the union from his father. She was not one that would have disturbed the house much on her own account. Every object she saw, the moment she crossed the threshold, appeared to delight her, and every circumstance that took place about her, except the preparing for the burial and the presence of the mourners. I thought she was half silly, from her behaviour while that went on. She ran into her chamber and made me come with her, though I should have been dressing the children, and there she sat shivering and clasping her hands, and asking repeatedly, Are they gone yet? Then she began describing with hysterical emotion the effect it produced on her to see black, and started, and trembled, and at last fell a-weeping, and when I asked what was the matter, answered she didn't know, but she felt so afraid of dying. I imagined her as little likely to die as myself. She was rather thin, but young, and fresh-complexioned, and her eyes sparkled as bright as diamonds. I did remark, to be sure, that mounting the stairs made her breathe very quick, that the least sudden noise set her all in a quiver, and that she coughed troublesomely sometimes, but I knew nothing of what these symptoms portended, and had no impulse to sympathise with her. We don't in general take to foreigners here, Mr Lockwood, unless they take to us first. Young Earnshaw was altered considerably in the three years of his absence. He had grown sparer, and lost his colour, and spoke and dressed quite differently, and on the very day of his return he told Joseph and me we must thenceforth quarter ourselves in the back kitchen, and leave the house for him. Indeed, he would have carpeted and papered a small spare room for a parlour, but his wife expressed such pleasure at the white floor and huge glowing fireplace, at the pewter dishes and elf case, and dog kennel, and the wide space there was to move about in where they usually sat, that he thought it unnecessary to her comfort, and so dropped the intention. She expressed pleasure, too, at finding a sister among her new acquaintance, and she prattled to Catherine, and kissed her, and ran about with her, and gave her quantities of presents at the beginning. Her affection tired very soon, however, and when she grew peevish, Hindley became tyrannical. A few words from her, evincing a dislike to Heathcliff, were enough to rouse in him all his old hatred of the boy. He drove him from their company to the servants, deprived him of the instructions of the curate, and insisted that he should labour out of doors instead, compelling him to do so as hard as any other lad on the farm. Heathcliff bore his degradation pretty well at first, because Cathy taught him what she learnt, and worked or played with him in the fields. They both promised fair to grow up as rude as savages, the young master being entirely negligent how they behaved, and what they did, so they kept clear of him. He would not have even seen after their going to church on Sundays, only Joseph and the curate reprimanded his carelessness when they absented themselves, and that reminded him to order Heathcliff a flogging, and Catherine a fast from dinner or supper. But it was one of their chief amusements to run away to the moors in the morning and remain there all day, and the after-punishment grew a mere thing to laugh at. The curate might set as many chapters as he pleased for Catherine to get by heart, and Joseph might thrash Heathcliff till his arm ached. They forgot everything the minute they were together again, at least the minute they had contrived some naughty plan of revenge, and many a time I've cried to myself to watch them growing more reckless daily, and I not daring to speak a syllable, for fear of losing the small power I still retained over the unfriended creatures. One Sunday evening it chanced that they were banished from the sitting-room, for making a noise or a light offence of the kind, and when I went to call them for supper I could discover them nowhere. We searched the house above and below, and the yard and stables, they were invisible, and at last Hindley, in a passion, told us to bolt the doors, and swore nobody should let them in that night. The household went to bed, and I, too, anxious to lie down, opened my lattice and put my head out to hearken, though it rained, determined to admit them in spite of the prohibition, should they return. In a while I distinguished steps coming up the road, and the light of a lantern glimmered through the gate. I threw a shawl over my head, and ran to prevent them from waking Mr. Earnshaw by knocking. There was Heathcliff, by himself. It gave me a start to see him alone. "'Where is Miss Catherine?' I cried hurriedly. "'No accident, I hope.' 
at Thrushcross Grange, he answered. And I would have been there too, but they had not the manners to ask me to stay. Well, you will catch it, I said. You'll never be content till you're sent about your business. What in the world led you wandering to Thrushcross Grange? Let me get off my wet clothes and I'll tell you all about it, Nelly, he replied. I bid him beware of rousing the master, and while he undressed and I waited to put out the candle, he continued. Cathy and I escaped from the wash-house to have a ramble at liberty, and getting a glimpse of the Grange lights, we thought we would just go and see whether the Lintons passed their Sunday evenings standing shivering in corners, while their father and mother sat eating and drinking and singing and laughing and burning their eyes out before the fire. Do you think they do? Or reading sermons and being catechized by their manservant, and set to learn a column of scripture names if they don't answer properly? Probably not, I responded. They are good children, no doubt, and don't deserve the treatment you receive for your bad conduct. Don't cant, Nelly, he said. Nonsense. We ran from the top of the heights to the park without stopping, Catherine completely beaten in the race because she was barefoot. You'll have to seek for her shoes in the bog tomorrow. We crept through a broken hedge, groped our way up the path, and planted ourselves on a flower plot under the drawing-room window. The light came from thence. They had not put up the shutters, and the curtains were only half closed. Both of us were able to look in by standing on the basement and clinging to the ledge, and we saw, ah, it was beautiful, a splendid place carpeted with crimson and crimson-covered chairs and tables, and a pure white ceiling bordered by gold, a shower of glass drops hanging in silver chains from the center and shimmering with little soft tapers. Old Mr. and Mrs. Linton were not there. Edgar and his sisters had it entirely to themselves. Shouldn't they have been happy? We should have thought ourselves in heaven. And now, guess what your good children were doing. Isabella, I believe she is eleven, a year younger than Cathy, lay screaming at the farther end of the room, shrieking as if witches were running red-hot needles into her. Edgar stood on the hearth weeping silently, and in the middle of the table sat a little dog, shaking its paw and yelping, which from their mutual accusations we understood they had nearly pulled in two between them. The idiots! That was their pleasure, to quarrel who should hold a heap of warm hair, and each begin to cry because both, after struggling to get it, refused to take it. We laughed outright at the petted things. We did despise them. When would you catch me wishing to have what Catherine wanted, or find us by ourselves seeking entertainment in yelling and sobbing and rolling on the ground, divided by the whole room? I'd not exchange for a thousand lives my condition here for Edgar Linton's at Thrushcross Grange, not if I might have the privilege of flinging Joseph off the highest gable and painting the house front with Hindley's blood. Hush, hush, I interrupted. Still you have not told me, Heathcliff, how Catherine is left behind. I told you we laughed, he answered. The Lintons heard us, and with one accord they shot like arrows to the door. There was silence, and then a cry, Oh, Mama, Mama, oh, Papa, oh, Mama, come here, oh, Papa, oh. They really did howl out something in that way. We made frightful noises to terrify them still more, and then we dropped off the ledge, because somebody was drawing the bars, and we felt we had better flee. I had Cathy by the hand and was urging her on, when all at once she fell down. Run, Heathcliff, run, she whispered. They have let the bulldog loose, and he holds me. The devil had seized her ankle, Nelly. I heard his abominable snorting. She did not yell out. No, she would have scorned to do it if she had been spitted on the horns of a mad cow. I did, though. I vociferated curses enough to annihilate any fiend in Christendom, and I got a stone and thrust it between his jaws and tried with all my might to cram it down his throat. A beast of a servant came up with a lantern at last, shouting, Keep fast, Skulker, keep fast. He changed his note, however, when he saw Skulker's game. The dog was throttled off, his huge purple tongue hanging half a foot out of his mouth and his pendant lips streaming with bloody slaver. The man took Cathy up. She was sick, not from fear, I'm certain, but from pain. He carried her in. I followed, grumbling execrations and vengeance. What pray, Robert? Hallooed Linton from the entrance. Skulker has caught a little girl, sir, he replied. There's a lad here. 
he added, making a clutch at me. Who looks an out and outer. Very like the robbers were for putting them through the window to open the doors to the gang after all were asleep, that they might murder us at their ease. Hold your tongue, you foul-mouthed thief, you. You shall go to the gallows for this. Mr. Linton, sir, don't lay by your gun. No, no, Robert, said the old fool. The rascals knew that yesterday was my rent day. They thought to have me cleverly. Come in, or finish them a reception. There, John, fasten the chain. Give Skulker some water, Jenny. To be at a magistrate in his stronghold, and on the Sabbath, too. Where will their insolence stop? Oh, my dear Mary, look here. Don't be afraid, it is but a boy. Yet the villain scowls so plainly in his face. Would it not be kindness to the country to hang him at once, before he shows his nature and acts as well as features? He pulled me under the chandelier, and Mrs. Linton placed her spectacles on her nose and raised her hands in horror. The cowardly children crept nearer also, Isabella lisping. Frightful thing! Put him in the cellar, papa. He is exactly like the son of the fortune-teller that stole my tame pheasant. Isn't he, Edgar? While they examined me, Cathy came round. She heard the last speech and laughed. Edgar Linton, after an inquisitive stare, collected sufficient wit to recognize her. They see us at church, you know, though we seldom meet them elsewhere. That's Miss Earnshaw, he whispered to his mother. And look how Skulker has been there. Our foot bleeds. Miss Earnshaw? Nonsense, cried the dame. Miss Earnshaw's carrying the country with a gypsy, and yet, my dear, the child is in mourning, surely it is, and she might be lamed for life. What culpable carelessness in her brother, exclaimed Mr. Linton, turning from me to Catherine. I've understood from Shielders, that was the curate, sir, that he lets her grow up in absolute heathenism. But who is this? Where did she pick up this companion? Oh, I declare he is that strange acquisition my late neighbour made in his journey to Liverpool. A little Lascar, or an American, or Spanish castaway. A wicked boy at all events, remarked the old lady. And quite unfit for a decent house. Did you notice his language, Linton? I'm shocked that my children should have heard it. I recommenced cursing, don't be angry, Nelly, and so Robert was ordered to take me off. I refused to go without Cathy. He dragged me into the garden, pushed the lantern into my hand, assured me that Mr. Earnshaw should be informed of my behavior, and, bidding me march directly, secured the door again. The curtains were still looped up at one corner, and I resumed my station as spy, because if Catherine had wished to return, I intended shattering their great glass panes to a million of fragments unless they let her out. She sat on the sofa quietly. Mrs. Linton took off the grey cloak of the dairy-maid, which we had borrowed for our excursion, shaking her head and expostulating with her, I suppose. She was a young lady, and they made a distinction between her treatment and mine. Then the woman-servant brought a basin of warm water and washed her feet, and Mr. Linton mixed a tumbler of negus, and Isabella emptied a plateful of cakes into her lap, and Edgar stood gaping at a distance. Afterwards they dried and combed her beautiful hair, and gave her a pair of enormous slippers, and wheeled her to the fire. And I left her, as merry as she could be, dividing her food between the little dog and skulker, whose nose she pinched as he ate, and kindling a spark of spirit in the vacant blue eyes of the Lintons, a dim reflection from her own enchanting face. I saw they were full of stupid admiration. She is so immeasurably superior to them to everybody on earth. Is she not, Nelly? There will more come of this business than you reckon on, I answered, covering him up and extinguishing the light. You are incurable, Heathcliff, and Mr. Hindley will have to proceed to extremities, see if he won't. My words came truer than I desired. The luckless adventure made Earnshaw furious, and then Mr. Linton, to mend matters, paid us a visit himself on the morrow, and read the young master such a lecture on the road he guided his family that he was stirred to look about him in earnest. Heathcliff received no flogging, but he was told that the first word he spoke to Miss Catherine should ensure a dismissal, and Mrs. Earnshaw undertook to keep her sister-in-law in due restraint when she returned home, employing art, not force. With force, 
she would have found it impossible. Chapter 7 of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte Cathy stayed at Thrushcross Grange five weeks, till Christmas. By that time her ankle was thoroughly cured, and her manners much improved. The mistress visited her often in the interval, and commenced her plan of reform by trying to raise her self-respect with fine clothes and flattery, which she took too readily, so that, instead of a wild, hatless little savage jumping into the house and rushing to squeeze us all breathless, there lighted from a handsome black pony a very dignified person, with brown ringlets falling from the cover of a feathered beaver and a long cloth habit, which she was obliged to hold up with both hands, that she might sail in. Hindley lifted her from the horse, exclaiming delightedly, Why, Cathy, you are quite a beauty. I should scarcely have known you. You look like a lady now. Isabella Lytton has not to be compared with her, is she, Frances? Isabella has not her natural advantages, replied his wife. But she must mind and not grow wild here. Ellen, help Miss Catherine off with her things. Stay, dear. You will disarrange your curls. Let me untie your hat. I removed the habit, and there shone forth beneath a grand plaid silk frock, white trousers, and burnished shoes, and... While her eyes sparkled joyfully when the dogs came bounding up to welcome her, she dared hardly touch them, lest they should fawn upon her splendid garments. She kissed me gently. I was all flour making the Christmas cake, and it would not have done to give me a hug. And then she looked round for Heathcliff. Mr. and Mrs. Earnshaw watched anxiously their meeting, thinking it would enable them to judge in some measure what ground they had for hoping to succeed in separating the two friends. Heathcliff was hard to discover at first. If he were careless and uncared for before Catherine's absence, he had been ten times more so since. Nobody but I even did him the kindness to call him a dirty boy, and bid him wash himself once a week, and children of his age seldom have a natural pleasure in soap and water. Therefore, not to mention his clothes, which had seen three months' service in mire and dust, and his thick uncombed hair— the surface of his face and hands was dismally beclouded. He might well skulk behind the settle, on beholding such a bright, graceful damsel enter the house, instead of a rough-headed counterpart of himself, as he expected. "'Is Heathcliff not here?' she demanded, pulling off her gloves, and displaying fingers wonderfully whitened with doing nothing and staying indoors. "'Heathcliff, you may come forward,' cried Mr. Hindley, enjoying his discomfiture, and gratified to see what a forbidding young blackguard he would be compelled to present himself. You may come and wish Miss Catherine welcome, like the other servants. Cathy, catching a glimpse of her friend in his concealment, flew to embrace him. She bestowed seven or eight kisses on his cheek within the second, and then stopped, and drawing back, burst into a laugh, exclaiming, Why, how very black and cross you look! And how... how funny and grim! "'But that's because I'm used to Edgar and Isabella Linton. "'Well, Heathcliff, have you forgotten me?' "'She had some reason to put the question, "'for shame and pride threw double gloom over his countenance "'and kept him immovable. "'Shake hands, Heathcliff,' said Mr. Earnshaw, condescendingly. "'Once in a way that is permitted.' "'I shall not,' replied the boy, finding his tongue at last. "'I shall not stand to be laughed at. I shall not bear it.' and he would have broken from the circle, but Miss Cathy seized him again. "'I did not mean to laugh at you,' she said. "'I could not hinder myself. "'Heathcliff, shake hands at least. "'What are you sulky for? "'It was only that you looked odd. "'If you wash your face and brush your hair, it will be all right. "'But you are so dirty.' She gazed concernedly at the dusky fingers she held in her own, and also at her dress, which she feared had gained no embellishment from its contact with his. You needn't have touched me, he answered, following her eye and snatching away his hand. I shall be as dirty as I please, and I like to be dirty, and I will be dirty. With that, he dashed head foremost out of the room, amid the merriment of the master and mistress, and to the serious disturbance of Catherine, who could not comprehend how her remarks should have produced such an exhibition of bad temper. After playing lady's maid to the newcomer, and putting my cakes in the oven, and making the house and kitchen cheerful with great fires, befitting Christmas Eve, I prepared to sit down and amuse myself by singing carols, all alone, 
regardless of Joseph's affirmations that he considered the merry tunes I chose as next door to songs. He had retired to private prayer in his chamber, and Mr. and Mrs. Earnshaw were engaging Missy's attention by sundry gay trifles bought for her to present to the little Lintons as an acknowledgement of their kindness. They had invited them to spend the morrow at Wuthering Heights, and the invitation had been accepted, on one condition. Mrs. Linton begged that her darlings might be kept carefully apart from that. Naughty, swearing boy. Under these circumstances, I remained solitary. I smelt the rich scent of the heating spices, and admired the shining kitchen utensils, the polished clock, decked in holly, the silver mugs ranged on a tray ready to be filled with mulled ale for supper, and above all, the speckless purity of my particular care, the scoured and well-swept floor. I gave due inward applause to every object, and then I remembered how old Earnshaw used to come in when all was tidied, and call me a cant lass and slip a shilling into my hand as a Christmas box. And from that I went on to think of his fondness for Heathcliff, and his dread lest he should suffer neglect after death had removed him, and that naturally led me to consider the poor lad's situation now, and from singing I changed my mind to crying. It struck me soon, however, there would be more sense in endeavouring to repair some of his wrongs than shedding tears over them. I got up and walked into the court to see him. He was not far. I found him smoothing the glossy coat of the new pony in the stable, and feeding the other beasts, according to custom. "'Make haste, Heathcliff,' I said. "'The kitchen is so comfortable, and Joseph is upstairs. Make haste, and let me dress you smart before Miss Cathy comes out, and then you can sit together.' with the whole hearth to yourselves, and have a long chatter till bedtime. He proceeded with his task, and never turned his head towards me. "'Come, are you coming?' I continued. "'There's a little cake for each of you, nearly enough, and you'll need half an hour's donning.' I waited five minutes, but getting no answer left him. Catherine supped with her brother and sister-in-law. Joseph and I had joined at an unsociable meal— seasoned with reproofs on one side and sauciness on the other. His cake and cheese remained on the table all night for the fairies. He managed to continue work till nine o'clock, and then marched a dumb and dour to his chamber. Cathy set up late, having a world of things to order for the reception of her new friends. She came into the kitchen once to speak to her old one, but he was gone, and she only stayed to ask what was the matter with him, and then went back. In the morning he rose early, and, as it was a holiday, carried his ill-humour on to the moors, not reappearing till the family were departed for church. Fasting and reflection seemed to have brought him to a better spirit. He hung about me for a while, and having screwed up his courage, exclaimed abruptly, Nellie, make me decent. I'm going to be good. High time, Heathcliff, I said. You have grieved Catherine. She's sorry she ever came home, I dare say. It looks as if you envied her, because she is more thought of than you. The notion of envying Catherine was incomprehensible to him, but the notion of grieving her he understood clearly enough. Did she say she was grieved? He inquired, looking very serious. She cried when I told her you were off again this morning. Well, I cried last night, he returned. And I had more reason to cry than she. Yes, you had the reason of going to bed with a proud heart and an empty stomach, said I. Proud people breed sad sorrows for themselves. But, if you be ashamed of your touchiness, you must ask pardon, mind, when she comes in. You must go up and offer to kiss her and say, you know best what to say, only do it heartily, and not as if you thought her converted into a stranger by her grand dress. And now, though I have dinner to get ready, I'll steal time to arrange you so that Edgar Linton shall look quite a dull beside you, and that he does, you are younger, and yet, I'll be bound, you are taller and twice as broad across the shoulders. You could knock him down in a twinkling. Don't you feel that you could? Heathcliff's face brightened a moment. Then it was overcast afresh, and he sighed. But, Nelly, if I knocked him down twenty times, that wouldn't make him less handsome or me more so. I wish I had light hair and a fair skin and was dressed and behaved as well and had a chance of being as rich as he will be. And cried for Mamma at every turn, I added, and trembled if a country lad heaved his fist against you, and sat at home all day for a shower of rain. Oh, Heathcliff, you are showing a poor spirit. Come to the glass, and I'll let you see what you should wish. 
Do you mark those two lines between your eyes, and those thick brows that, instead of rising, arched, sink in the middle, and that couple of black fiends so deeply buried, who never open their windows boldly but lurk glinting under them like devil's spies? Wish and learn to smooth away the surly wrinkles, to raise your lids frankly, and change the fiends to confident, innocent angels, suspecting and doubting nothing, and always seeing friends where they are not sure of foes. Don't get the expression of a vicious cur that appears to know the kicks it gets are its dessert, and yet hates all the world, as well as the kicker, for what it suffers. In other words, I must wish for Edgar Linton's great blue eyes and even forehead, he replied. I do, and that won't help me to them. A good heart will help you to a bonny face, my lad, I continued, if you were a regular black, and a bad one will turn the bonniest into something worse than ugly. And now that we've done washing and combing and sulking, tell me whether you don't think yourself rather handsome. I'll tell you, I do. You're fit for a prince in disguise. Who knows but your father was emperor of China, and your mother an Indian queen, each of them able to buy up with one week's income Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange together. And you were kidnapped by wicked sailors and brought to England. Were I in your place, I would frame high notions of my birth, and the thoughts of what I was should give me courage and dignity to support the oppressions of a little farmer. So I chattered on, and Heathcliff gradually lost his frown and began to look quite pleasant, when all at once our conversation was interrupted by a rumbling sound moving up the road and entering the court. He ran to the window and I to the door, just in time to behold the two Lintons descend from the family carriage, smothered in cloaks and furs, and the Earnshaws dismount from their horses. They often rode to church in winter. Catherine took a hand of each of the children and brought them into the house and set them before the fire, which quickly put colour into their white faces. I urged my companion to hasten now and show his amiable humour, and he willingly obeyed, but ill luck would have it that, as he opened the door leading from the kitchen on one side, Hindley opened it on the other. They met, and the master, irritated at seeing him clean and cheerful, or, perhaps, eager to keep his promise to Mrs. Linton, shoved him back with a sudden thrust and angrily bade Joseph. Keep the fellow out of the room. Send him into the garret till dinner's over. He'll be cramming his fingers in the tarts, and stealing the fruit if left alone with them a minute. Nay, sir, I could not avoid answering. He'll touch nothing, not he, and I suppose he must have his share of the dainties as well as we. He shall have his share in my hand if I catch him downstairs till dark, cried Hindley. Be gone, you vagabond. What, are you tempting the coxcomb, are you? Wait till I get hold of those elegant locks. See if I won't pull them a bit longer. They're long enough already, observed Master Linton, peeping from the doorway. I wonder they don't make his head ache. It's like a colt's mane over his eyes. He ventured this remark without any intention to insult, but Heathcliff's violent nature was not prepared to endure the appearance of impertinence from one whom he seemed to hate, even then as a rival. He seized a tureen of hot applesauce, the first thing that came under his grip, and dashed it full against the speaker's face and neck, who instantly commenced a lament that brought Isabella and Catherine hurrying to the place. Mr. Earnshaw snatched up the culprit directly and conveyed him to his chamber, where, doubtless, he administered a rough remedy to cool the fit of passion, for he appeared red and breathless. I got the dishcloth, and rather spitefully scrubbed Edgar's nose and mouth, affirming it to serve him right for meddling. His sister began weeping to go home, and Cathy stood by confounded, blushing for all. "'You should not have spoken to him,' she expostulated with Master Linton. "'He was in a bad temper, and now you've spoilt your visit, and he'll be flogged. I hate him to be flogged. I can't eat my dinner. Why did you speak to him, Edgar?' "'I didn't.' sobbed the youth, escaping from my hands and finishing the remainder of the purification with his cambric pocket handkerchief. I promised Mamma I wouldn't say one word to him, and I didn't. Well, don't cry, replied Catherine contemptuously. You're not killed. Don't make more mischief. My brother is coming. Be quiet. Hush, Isabella. Has anybody hurt you? There, there, children, to your seats, cried Hindley, bustling in. That brute of a lad has warmed me nicely. Next time, Master Edgar, take the lawn to your own fists. It will give you an appetite. 
The little party recovered its equanimity at sight of the fragrant feast. They were hungry after their ride, and easily consoled, since no real harm had befallen them. Mr Earnshaw carved bountiful platefuls, and the mistress made them merry with lively talk. I waited behind her chair, and was pained to behold Catherine, with dry eyes and an indifferent air, commence cutting up the wing of a goose before her. An unfeeling child, I thought to myself. How lightly she dismisses her old playmate's troubles. I could not have imagined her to be so selfish. She lifted a mouthful to her lips. Then she set it down again. Her cheeks flushed, and the tears gushed over them. She slipped her fork to the floor, and hastily dived under the cloth to conceal her emotion. I did not call her unfeeling long, for I perceived she was in purgatory throughout the day, and wearying to find an opportunity of getting by herself, or paying a visit to Heathcliff, who had been locked up by the master, as I discovered, on endeavouring to introduce to him a private mess of victuals. In the evening we had a dance. Cathy begged that he might be liberated then, as Isabella Linton had no partner. Her entreaties were vain, and I was appointed to supply the deficiency. We got rid of all the gloom in the excitement of the exercise, and our pleasure was increased by the arrival of the Gimmerton band, mustering fifteen strong, a trumpet, a trombone, clarinets, bassoons, French horns, and a bass viol, besides singers. They go the rounds of all the respectable houses, and receive contributions every Christmas, and we esteemed it a first-rate treat to hear them. After the usual carols had been sung, we set them to songs and glees. Mrs. Earnshaw loved the music, and so they gave us plenty. Catherine loved it too, but she said it sounded sweetest at the top of the steps, and she went up in the dark. I followed. They shut the house door below, never noting our absence. It was so full of people. She made no stay at the stairs head, but mounted farther, to the garret where Heathcliff was confined, and called him. He stubbornly declined answering for a while. She persevered, and finally persuaded him to hold communion with her through the boards. I let the poor things converse unmolested, till I supposed the songs were going to cease, and the singers to get some refreshment— then I clambered up the ladder to warn her. Instead of finding her outside, I heard her voice within. The little monkey had crept by the skylight of one garret along the roof, into the skylight of the other, and it was with the utmost difficulty I could coax her out again. When she did come, Heathcliff came with her, and she insisted that I should take him into the kitchen as my fellow servant had gone to a neighbour's to be removed from the sound of our devil's psalmody, as it pleased him to call it. I told them I intended by no means to encourage their tricks, but as the prisoner had never broken his fast since yesterday's dinner, I would wink at his cheating Mr. Hindley that once. He went down. I set him a stool by the fire, and offered him a quantity of good things, but he was sick, and could eat little, and my attempts to entertain him were thrown away. He leant his two elbows on his knees, and his chin on his hands, and remained wrapped in dumb meditation. On my inquiring the subject of his thoughts, he answered gravely, I'm trying to settle how I shall pay Hindley back. I don't care how long I wait, if I can only do it at last. I hope he will not die before I do. For shame, Heathcliff, said I. It is for God to punish wicked people. We should learn to forgive. No, God won't have the satisfaction that I shall, he returned. I only wish I knew the best way. Let me alone, and I'll plan it out. While I'm thinking of that, I don't feel pain. But, Mr. Lockwood, I forget these tales cannot divert you. I'm annoyed how I should dream of chattering on at such a rate, and your gruel cold, and you nodding for bed. I could have told Heathcliff's history, all that you need to hear, in half a dozen words. Thus interrupting herself, the housekeeper rose, and proceeded to lay aside her sewing. But I felt incapable of moving from the hearth, and I was very far from nodding. "'Sit still, Mrs. Dean,' I cried. "'Do sit still another half-hour. "'You've done just right to tell the story leisurely. "'That is the method I like, "'and you must finish it in the same style. "'I am interested in every character you have mentioned, more or less.' "'The clock is on the stroke of eleven, sir.' "'No matter. "'I am not accustomed to go to bed in the long hours. "'One or two is early enough for a person who lies till ten. "'You shouldn't lie till ten. There's the very prime of the morning gone long before that time. A person who has not done one half his day's work by ten o'clock runs a chance of leaving the other half undone. Nevertheless, Mrs. Dean, resume your chair. 
because to-morrow I intend lengthening the night till afternoon. I prognosticate for myself an obstinate cold, at least. I hope not, sir. Well, you must allow me to leap over some three years. During that space, Mrs. Earnshaw. No, no, I'll allow nothing of the sort. Are you acquainted with the mood of mind in which, if you were seated alone, and the cat licking its kitten on the rug before you, you would watch the operation so intently that Puss's neglect of one ear would put you seriously out of temper? A terribly lazy mood, I should say. On the contrary, a tiresomely active one. It is mine at present, and therefore continue minutely. I perceive that people in these regions acquire over people in towns the value that a spider in a dungeon does over a spider in a cottage to their various occupants. And yet the deepened attraction is not entirely owing to the situation of the looker-on. They do live more in earnest, more in themselves, and less in surface, change, and frivolous external things. I could fancy a love for life here almost possible, and I was a fixed unbeliever in any love of a year's standing. One state resembles setting a hungry man down to a single dish, on which he may concentrate his entire appetite and do it justice. The other, introducing him to a table laid out by French cooks, he can perhaps extract as much enjoyment from the whole, but each part is a mere atom in his regard and remembrance. Oh, here we are the same as anywhere else, when you get to know us, observed Mrs. Dean, somewhat puzzled at my speech. Excuse me, I responded. You, my good friend, are a striking evidence against that assertion. Excepting a few provincialisms of slight consequence, you have no marks of the manners which I am habituated to consider as peculiar to your class. I am sure you have thought a great deal more than the generality of servants think. You have been compelled to cultivate your reflective faculties, for want of occasions for frittering your life away in silly trifles. Mrs. Dean laughed. I certainly esteem myself a steady, reasonable kind of body, she said, not exactly from living among the hills and seeing one set of faces and one series of actions from year's end to year's end, but I have undergone sharp discipline which has taught me wisdom, and then I have read more than you would fancy, Mr. Lockwood. You could not open a book in this library that I have not looked into, and got something out of also, unless it be that range of Greek and Latin and that of French, and those I know one from another. It is as much as you can expect of a poor man's daughter. However, if I am to follow my story in true gossip's fashion, I had better go on. And, instead of leaping three years, I will be content to pass to the next summer, the summer of 1778. That is nearly twenty-three years ago. Chapter 8 of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte On the morning of a fine June day, my first bonny little nursling, and the last of the ancient Earnshaw stock, was born. We were busy with the hay in a faraway field, and the girl that usually brought our breakfast came running an hour too soon across the meadow and up the lane, calling me as she ran. Oh, such a grand bairn, she panted out. The finest lad that ever breathed. But the doctor says Mrs. must go. He says she's been in a consumption these many months. I heard him tell Mr. Hindley, and now she has nothing to keep her, and she'll be dead before winter. You must come home directly. You're to nurse it, Nellie, to feed it with sugar and milk, and take care of it day and night. I wish I were you, because it will be all yours when there is no missus. But is she very ill? I asked, flinging down my rake and tying my bonnet. I guess she is, yet she looks bravely, replied the girl. And she talks as if she thought of living to see it grow a man. She's out of her head for joy at such a beauty. If I were her, I'm certain I should not die. I should get better at the bare sight of it, in spite of Kenneth. I was fairly mad at him. Dame Archer brought the cherub down to Master in the house, and his face just begun to light up when the old croaker steps forward and says he, Earnshaw, it's a blessing your wife has been spared to leave you this son. When she came, I felt convinced we shouldn't keep her long, and now, I must tell you, the winter will probably finish her. Don't take on and fret about it too much, it can't be helped. And besides, you should have known better than to choose such a rush of a lass. And what did the Master answer? I inquired. I think he swore, but I didn't mind him. I was strained to see the bairn. And she began again to describe it rapturously. I, as zealous as herself, hurried eagerly home to admire, on my part, though I was very sad for Hindley's sake. He had room in his heart only for two idols, his wife and himself. He doted on both, and adored one, and I couldn't conceive how he would bear the loss. When we got to Wuthering Heights, there he stood at the front door, and as I passed in, I asked, how was the baby? Nearly ready to run about now, he replied, putting on a cheerful smile. 
And the mistress, I ventured to inquire. The doctor says she is... Damn the doctor. He interrupted, reddening. Francis is quite right. She'll be perfectly well by this time next week. Are you going upstairs? Will you tell her that I'll come if she'll promise not to talk? I left her because she would not hold her tongue. And she must. Tell her Mr. Kenneth says she must be quiet. I delivered this message to Mrs. Earnshaw. She seemed in flighty spirits, and replied merrily. I hardly spoke a word, Ellen, and there he has gone out twice, crying. Well, I say I promise I won't speak. Well, that doesn't bind me not to laugh at him. Poor soul, till within a week of her death that gay heart never failed her, and her husband persisted doggedly, nay furiously, in affirming her health improved every day. When Kenneth warned him that his medicines were useless at that stage of the malady, and he needn't put him to further expense by attending her, he retorted, I know you need not. She's well. She does not want any more attendance from you. She never was in a consumption. It was a fever and it's gone. Her pulse is as slow as mine now, and her cheek is cool. He told his wife the same story, and she seemed to believe him. But one night, while leaning on his shoulder, in the act of saying she thought she would be able to get up tomorrow, a fit of coughing took her, a very slight one. He raised her in his arms, she put her two hands about his neck, her face changed, and she was dead. As the girl had anticipated, the child Herriton fell wholly into my hands. Mr. Earnshaw, provided he saw him healthy, and never heard him cry, was contented as far as regarded him. For himself, he grew desperate. His sorrow was of the kind that will not lament. He neither wept nor prayed. He cursed and defied, execrated God and man, and gave himself up to reckless dissipation. The servants could not bear his tyrannical and evil conduct long. Joseph and I were the only two that would stay. I had not the heart to leave my charge, and besides, you know, I had been his foster sister and excused his behaviour more readily than a stranger would. Joseph remained to Hector over tenants and labourers, and because it was his vocation to be where he had plenty of wickedness to reprove. The master's bad ways and bad companions formed a pretty example for Catherine and Heathcliff. His treatment of the latter was enough to make a fiend of a saint, and truly it appeared as if the lad were possessed of something diabolical at that period. He delighted to witness Hindley degrading himself past redemption, and became daily more notable for savage sullenness and ferocity. I could not half tell what an infernal house we had. The curate dropped calling, and nobody decent came near us, at last, unless Edgar Linton's visits to Miss Cathy might be an exception. At fifteen she was the queen of the countryside. She had no peer, and she did turn out a haughty, headstrong creature. I own I did not like her, after infancy was past, and I vexed her frequently by trying to bring down her arrogance. She never took an aversion to me, though. She had a wondrous constancy to old attachments. Even Heathcliff kept his hold on her affections unalterably, and young Linton, with all his superiority, found it difficult to make an equally deep impression. He was my late master. That is his portrait over the fireplace." It used to hang on one side, and his wife's on the other. But hers has been removed, or else you might see something of what she was. Can you make that out? Mrs. Dean raised the candle, and I discerned a soft-featured face, exceedingly resembling the young lady at the heights, but more pensive and amiable in expression. It formed a sweet picture. The long, light hair curled slightly on the temples. The eyes were large and serious, the figure almost too graceful. I did not marvel how Catherine Earnshaw could forget her first friend for such an individual. I marvelled much how he, with a mind to correspond with his person, could fancy my idea of Catherine Earnshaw. A very agreeable portrait, I observed to the housekeeper. Is it like? Yes, she answered. But he looked better when he was animated. That is his everyday countenance. He wanted spirit in general. Catherine had kept up her acquaintance with the Lintons since her five weeks' residence among them, and as she had no temptation to show her rough side in their company, and had the sense to be ashamed of being rude where she experienced such invariable courtesy, she imposed unwittingly on the old lady and gentleman by her ingenuous cordiality, gained the admiration of Isabella and the heart and soul of her brother. 
acquisitions that flattered her from the first, for she was full of ambition, and led her to adopt a double character without exactly intending to deceive anyone. In the place where she heard Heathcliff termed a vulgar young ruffian, and worse than a brute, she took care not to act like him. But at home, she had small inclination to practice politeness that would only be laughed at, and restrain any unruly nature when it would bring her neither credit nor praise. Mr. Edgar seldom mustered courage to visit Wuthering Heights openly. He had a terror of Earnshaw's reputation, and shrunk from encountering him, and yet he was always received with our best attempts at civility. The master himself avoided offending him, knowing why he came, and if he could not be gracious, kept out of the way. I rather think his appearance there was distasteful to Catherine. She was not artful, never played the coquette, and had evidently an objection to her two friends mating at all. For when Heathcliff expressed contempt of Linton in his presence, she could not half coincide, as she did in his absence, and when Linton evinced disgust and antipathy to Heathcliff, she dared not treat his sentiments with indifference, as if deprecation of her playmate were of scarcely any consequence to her. I've had many a laugh at her perplexities and untold troubles, which she vainly strove to hide from my mockery. That sounds ill-natured, but she was so proud it became really impossible to pity her distresses, till she should be chastened into more humility. She did bring herself finally to confess, and to confide in me. There was not a soul else that she might fashion into an adviser. Mr. Hindley had gone from home one afternoon, and Heathcliff presumed to give himself a holiday on the strength of it. He had reached the age of sixteen then, I think, and without having bad features or being deficient in intellect, he contrived to convey an impression of inward and outward repulsiveness that his present aspect retains no traces of. In the first place, he had by that time lost the benefit of his early education, continual hard work, begun soon and concluded late, had extinguished any curiosity he once possessed in pursuit of knowledge, and any love for books or learning. His childhood's sense of superiority instilled into him by the favours of old Mr. Earnshaw was faded away. He struggled long to keep up an equality with Catherine in her studies, and yielded with poignant though silent regret. But he yielded completely, and there was no prevailing on him to take a step in the way of moving upward, when he found he must necessarily sink beneath his former level. Then personal appearance sympathised with mental deterioration, he acquired a slouching gait and ignoble look. His naturally reserved disposition was exaggerated into an almost idiotic excess of unsociable moroseness, and he took a grim pleasure, apparently, in exciting the aversion rather than the esteem of his few acquaintance. Catherine and he were constant companions still at his seasons of respite from labour, but he had ceased to express his fondness for her in words, and recoiled with angry suspicion from her girlish caresses, as if conscious there could be no gratification in lavishing such marks of affection on him. On the before-named occasion he came into the house to announce his intention of doing nothing, while I was assisting Miss Cathy to arrange her dress. She had not reckoned on his taking it into his head to be idle, and imagining she would have the whole place to herself, she managed, by some means, to inform Mr. Edgar of her brother's absence, and was then preparing to receive him. "'Cathy, are you busy this afternoon?' asked Heathcliff. "'Are you going anywhere?' "'No, it is raining,' she answered. "'Why have you that silk frock on, then?' he said. "'Nobody coming here, I hope.' "'Not that I know of,' stammered Miss. "'But you should be in the field now, Heathcliff.' It is an hour past dinner time. I thought you were gone. Hindley does not often free us from his accursed presence, observed the boy. I'll not work any more today. I'll stay with you. Oh, but Joseph will tell, she suggested. You'd better go. Joseph is loading lime on the further side of Peniston Crags. It will take him till dark, and he'll never know. So, saying, he lounged to the fire and sat down. Catherine reflected an instant, with knitted brows. She found it needful to smooth the way for an intrusion. "'Isabella and Edgar Linton talked of calling this afternoon,' she said, at the conclusion of a minute's silence. "'As it rains, I hardly expect them. But they may come. And if they do, 
you run the risk of being scolded for no good. Order Ellen to say you are engaged, Cathy. He persisted. Don't turn me out for those pitiful, silly friends of yours. I'm on the point sometimes of complaining that they... But I'll not. That they what? cried Catherine, gazing at him with a troubled countenance. Oh, Nelly, she added petulantly, jerking her hand away from my hands. You've combed my hair quite out of curl. That's enough. Let me alone. What are you on the point of complaining about, Heathcliff? Nothing. Only look at the almanac on that wall. He pointed to a framed sheet hanging near the window and continued. The crosses are for the evenings you have spent with the Lintons. The dots for those spent with me. Do you see? I've marked every day. Yes, very foolish, as if I took notice, replied Catherine in a peevish tone. And where is the sense of that? To show that I do take notice, said Heathcliff. And should I always be sitting with you? She demanded, growing more irritated. What good do I get? What do you talk about? You might be dumb, or a baby, for anything you say to amuse me, or for anything you do, either. You never told me before that I talked too little, or that you disliked my company, Cathy, exclaimed Heathcliff in much agitation. It's no company at all, when people know nothing and say nothing, she muttered. Her companion rose up, but he hadn't time to express his feelings further, for a horse's feet were heard on the flags, and having knocked gently, young Linton entered, his face brilliant with delight at the unexpected summon he had received. Doubtless Catherine marked the difference between her friends, as one came in and the other went out. The contrast resembled what you see in exchanging a bleak, hilly coal country for a beautiful, fertile valley, and his voice and greeting were as opposite as his aspect. He had a sweet, low manner of speaking, and pronounced his words as you do, that's less gruff than we talk here, and softer. I'm not come too soon, am I? He said, casting a look at me. I had begun to wipe the plate and tidy some drawers at the far end of the dresser. No, answered Catherine. What are you doing there, Nelly? My work, miss, I replied. Mr. Hindley had given me directions to make a third party in any private visits Linton chose to pay. She stepped behind me and whispered crossly. Take yourself and your dusters off. When company are in the house, servants don't commence scouring and cleaning in the room where they are. It's a good opportunity now that Master is away, I answered aloud. He hates me to be fidgeting over these things in his presence. I'm sure Mr. Edgar will excuse me. I hate you to be fidgeting in my presence, exclaimed the young lady imperiously, not allowing her guest time to speak. She had failed to recover her equanimity since the little dispute with Heathcliff. "'I'm sorry for it, Miss Catherine,' was my response, and I proceeded assiduously with my occupation. She, supposing Edgar could not see her, snatched the cloth from my hand and pinched me with a prolonged wrench very spitefully on the arm. I've said I did not love her, and rather relished mortifying her vanity now and then. Besides, she hurt me extremely— so I started up from my knees and screamed out, "'Oh, miss, that's a nasty trick. You have no right to nip me, and I'm not going to bear it.' "'I didn't touch you, you lying creature!' cried she, her fingers tingling to repeat the act, and her ears red with rage. She never had power to conceal her passion. It always set her whole complexion in a blaze. "'What's that, then?' I retorted, showing a decided purple witness to refute her. She stamped her foot, wavered a moment, and then, irresistibly impelled by the naughty spirit within her, slapped me on the cheek, a stinging blow that filled both eyes with water. "'Catherine, love, Catherine!' interposed Linton, greatly shocked at the double fault of falsehood and violence which his idol had committed. "'Leave the room, Ellen!' she repeated, trembling all over. Little Hareton, who followed me everywhere, and was sitting near me on the floor, at seeing my tears commenced crying himself, and sobbed out complaints against wicked Aunt Cathy, which drew her fury onto his unlucky head. She seized his shoulders and shook him till the poor child waxed livid, and Edgar thoughtlessly laid hold of her hands to deliver him. In an instant one was wrung free, and the astonished young man felt it applied over his own ear in a way that could not be mistaken for jest. 
He drew back in consternation. I lifted Harriton in my arms and walked off to the kitchen with him, leaving the door of communication open, for I was curious to watch how they would settle their disagreement. The insulted visitor moved to the spot where he had laid his hat, pale and with a quivering lip. "'That's right,' I said to myself. "'Take warning and be gone. It's a kindness to let you have a glimpse of her genuine disposition.' "'Where are you going?' demanded Catherine, advancing to the door. He swerved aside and attempted to pass. "'You must not go!' she exclaimed energetically. "'I must, and shall,' he replied in a subdued voice. "'No!' she persisted, grasping the handle. "'Not yet, Edgar Linton. Sit down. You shall not leave me in that temper. I should be miserable all night, and I won't be miserable for you.' "'Can I stay after you have struck me?' asked Linton. Catherine was mute. "'You've made me afraid and ashamed of you,' he continued. "'I'll not come here again.' Her eyes began to glisten and her lids to twinkle. "'And you told a deliberate untruth,' he said. "'I didn't,' she cried, recovering her speech. "'I did nothing deliberately. "'Well, go, if you please. Get away. "'And now I'll cry. I'll cry myself sick.' She dropped down on her knees by a chair and set to weeping in serious earnest. Edgar persevered in his resolution as far as the court. There he lingered. I resolved to encourage him. "'Miss is dreadfully wayward, sir,' I called out. "'As bad as any marred child. You'd better be riding home, or else she will be sick, only to grieve us.' The soft thing looked askance through the window, he possessed the power to depart as much as a cat possesses the power to leave a mouse half-killed or a bird half-eaten. Ah, I thought, there will be no saving him. He's doomed and flies to his fate. And so it was. He turned abruptly, hastened into the house again, shut the door behind him, and when I went in a while after to inform them that Earnshaw had come home rabid drunk, ready to pull the whole place about our ears, his ordinary frame of mind in that condition, I saw the quarrel had merely affected a closer intimacy, had broken the outworks of youthful timidity, and enabled them to forsake the disguise of friendship and confess themselves lovers. Intelligence of Mr. Hindley's arrival drove Linton speedily to his horse and Catherine to her chamber. I went to hide little Hareton and to take the shot out of the master's fowling piece, which he was fond of playing with in his insane excitement, to the hazard of the lives of any who provoked or even attracted his notice too much, and I had hit upon the plan of removing it that he might do less mischief if he did go to the length of firing the gun. Chapter 9 of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. He entered, vociferating oaths dreadful to hear, and caught me in the act of stowing his son away in the kitchen cupboard. Harriton was impressed with a wholesome terror of encountering either his wild beast's fondness or his madman's rage, for in one he ran a chance of being squeezed and kissed to death, and in the other of being flung into the fire or dashed against the wall, and the poor thing remained perfectly quiet wherever I chose to put him. "'There, I found it out at last,' cried Hindley, pulling me back by the skin of my neck like a dog. "'By heaven and hell, you sworn between you to murder that child. I know how it is now, that he is always out of my way. But, with the help of Satan, I shall make you swallow the carving knife, Nelly. You needn't laugh, for I've just crammed Kenneth head downmost in the Black Horse Marsh, and two is the same as one, and I want to kill some of you.' I shall have no rest till I do. But I don't like the carving knife, Mr. Hindley, I answered. It has been cutting red herrings. I'd rather be shot, if you please. You'd rather be damned, he said. And so you shall. No law in England can hinder a man from keeping his house decent and minds abominable. Open your mouth. He held the knife in his hand and pushed its point between my teeth. But, for my part, I was never much afraid of his vagaries. I spat out and affirmed it tasted detestably. I would not take it on any account. Oh, said he, releasing me. I see that hideous little villain is not hurting. I beg your pardon, Nell. If it be he deserves flaying alive for not running to welcome me. 
and for screaming as if I were a goblin. Unnatural cub, come hither. I'll teach thee to impose on a good-hearted, deluded father. Now, don't you think the lad would be handsomer cropped? It makes a dog fiercer, and I love something fierce. Get me that, scissors. Something fierce and trim. Besides, it's infernal affectation. Devilish conceit it is to cherish our ears. We're asses enough without them. Hush, child, hush. Well then, it is my darling. Wishes dry thy eyes. There's a joy, kiss me. What? It won't. Kiss me, Hareton. Damn thee, kiss me. By God, as if I would rear such a monster. As sure as I'm living, I'll break the brat's neck. Poor Hareton was squalling and kicking in his father's arms with all his might, and redoubled his yells when he carried him upstairs and lifted him over the banister. I cried out he would frighten the child into fits and ran to rescue him. As I reached them, Hindley leant forward on the rails to listen to a noise below, almost forgetting what he had in his hands. Who is that? He asked, hearing someone approaching on the stair's foot. I leant forward also, for the purpose of signing to Heathcliff, whose step I recognised, not to come further, and at the instant when my eye quitted Hareton, he gave a sudden spring, delivering himself from the careless grasp that held him, and fell. There was scarcely time to experience a thrill of horror before we saw that the little wretch was safe. Heathcliff arrived underneath just at the critical moment. By a natural impulse he arrested his descent, and setting him on his feet, looked up to discover the author of the accident, a miser who had parted with a lucky lottery ticket for five shillings, and finds next day he has lost in the bargain five thousand pounds, could not show a blanker countenance than he did on beholding the figure of Mr. Earnshaw above. It expressed, plainer than words could do, the intense anguish at having made himself the instrument of thwarting his own revenge. Had it been dark, I dare say he would have tried to remedy the mistake by smashing Hareton's skull on the steps. But we witnessed his salvation, and I was presently below with my precious charge pressed to my heart. Hindley descended more leisurely, sobered and abashed. It's your fault, Ellen, he said. You should have kept him out of sight. You should have taken him from me. Is he injured anywhere? Injured? I cried angrily. If he is not killed, he'll be an idiot. Oh, I wonder his mother does not rise from her grave to see how you use him. You're worse than a heathen, treating your own flesh and blood in that manner. He attempted to touch the child, who, on finding himself with me, sobbed off his terror directly. At the first finger his father laid on him, however, he shrieked again louder than before, and struggled as if he would go into convulsions. "'You shall not meddle with him,' I continued. "'He hates you. They all hate you. That's the truth. A happy family you have, and a pretty state you'll come to.' "'I shall come to a prettier yet, Nelly,' laughed the misguided man, recovering his hardness. "'At present, convey yourself and him away.' And hark you, Heathcliff, clear you too quite from my reach and hearing. I wouldn't murder you tonight unless, perhaps, I set the house on fire. But that's as my fancy goes. While saying this, he took a pint bottle of brandy from the dresser and poured some into a tumbler. Nay, don't, I entreated. Mr. Hindley, do take warning. Have mercy on this unfortunate boy, if you care nothing for yourself. Anyone will do better for him than I shall. He answered, "'Have mercy on your own soul,' I said, endeavouring to snatch the glass from his hand. "'Not I. On the contrary, I shall have great pleasure in sending it to perdition, to punish its maker,' exclaimed the blasphemer. "'Here's to its hearty damnation!' He drank the spirits and impatiently bade us go, terminating his command with a sequel of horrid imprecations too bad to repeat or remember." It's a pity he cannot kill himself with drink, observed Heathcliff, muttering an echo of curses back when the door was shut. He's doing his very utmost, but his constitution defies him. Mr. Kenneth says he would wager his mare that he'll outlive any man on this side Gimmerton, and go to the grave a hoary sinner, unless some happy chance out of the common course befall him. I went into the kitchen and sat down to lull my little lamb to sleep. Heathcliff, as I thought, walked through to the barn, 
It turned out afterwards that he only got as far as the other side of the settle when he flung himself on a bench by the wall, removed from the fire, and remained silent. I was rocking Hareton on my knee and humming a song that began. It was far in the night and the bairnies grat, the mither beneath the mools heard that. When Miss Cathy, who had listened to the hubbub from her room, put her head in and whispered, Are you alone, Nellie? Yes, miss, I replied. She entered and approached the hearth. I, supposing she was going to say something, looked up. The expression of her face seemed disturbed and anxious. Her lips were half asunder, as if she meant to speak, and she drew a breath, but it escaped in a sigh instead of a sentence. I resumed my song, not having forgotten her recent behaviour. "'Where's Heathcliff?' she said, interrupting me. "'About his work in the stable,' was my answer. He did not contradict me. Perhaps he had fallen into a doze. There followed another long pause, during which I perceived a drop or two trickle from Catherine's cheek to the flags. "'Is she sorry for her shameful conduct?' I asked myself. "'That will be a novelty. But she may come to the point. As she will, I shan't help her.' No, she felt small trouble regarding any subject, save her own concerns. "'Oh, dear!' she cried at last. "'I'm very unhappy!' "'A pity,' observed I. "'You're hard to please, so many friends and so few cares, and can't make yourself content.' "'Nelly, will you keep a secret for me?' she pursued, kneeling down by me, and lifting her winsome eyes to my face with that sort of look which turns off bad temper— even when one has all the right in the world to indulge it. "'Is it worth keeping?' I inquired, less sulkily. "'Yes, and it worries me, and I must let it out. I want to know what I should do. Today, Edgar Linton has asked me to marry him, and I've given him an answer. Now, before I tell you whether it was a consent or denial, you tell me which it ought to have been.' "'Really, Miss Catherine, how can I know?' I replied. "'To be sure, "'Considering the exhibition you performed in his presence this afternoon, "'I might say it would be wise to refuse him, "'since he asked you after that. "'He must either be hopelessly stupid or a venturesome fool.' "'If you talk so, I won't tell you any more,' "'she returned, peevishly rising to her feet. "'I accepted him, Nelly. "'Be quick and say whether I was wrong.' "'You accepted him? "'Then what good is it discussing the matter? "'You have pledged your word and cannot retract.' "'But say whether I should have done so. Do!' she exclaimed in an irritated tone, chafing her hands together and frowning. "'There are many things to be considered before that question can be answered properly,' I said sententiously. First and foremost, do you love Mr. Edgar?' "'Who can help it? Of course I do,' she answered. Then I put her through the following catechism. For a girl of twenty-two, it was not injudicious.' "'Why do you love him, Miss Cathy?' "'Nonsense! I do! That's sufficient!' "'By no means. You must say why.' "'Well, because he is handsome and pleasant to be with.' "'Bad!' was my commentary. "'And because he is young and cheerful.' "'Bad still!' "'And because he loves me.' "'Indifferent, coming there.' "'And he will be rich, and I shall like to be the greatest woman of the neighbourhood. "'and I shall be proud of having such a husband.' "'Worst of all. And now, say how you love him.' "'As everybody loves. You're silly, Nelly. "'Not at all. Answer.' "'I love the ground under his feet, and the air over his head, "'and everything he touches, and every word he says. "'I love all his looks, and all his actions, "'and him entirely, and all together. There now.' "'And why?' "'Nay, you are making a jest of it. It is exceedingly ill-natured. It's no jest to me,' said the young lady, scowling and turning her face to the fire. "'I'm very far from jesting, Miss Catherine,' I replied. "'You love Mr. Edgar because he is handsome and young and cheerful and rich and loves you. The last, however, goes for nothing. You would love him without that, probably, and with it you wouldn't, unless he possessed the four former attractions.' "'No, to be sure not. I should only pity him. Hate him, perhaps, if he were ugly and a clown.' "'But there are several other handsome, rich young men in the world, 
handsomer possibly and richer than he is what should hinder you from loving them if there be any they are out of my way i have seen none like edgar you may see some and he won't always be handsome and young and may not always be rich he is now and i have only to do with the present i wish you would speak rationally well that settles it if you have only to do with the present marry mr linton i don't want your permission for that i shall marry him and yet you have not told me whether i am right perfectly right if people be right to marry only for the present and now let us hear what you are unhappy about your brother will be pleased the old lady and gentleman will not object i think you will escape from a disorderly comfortless home into a wealthy respectable one and you love edgar and edgar loves you all seems smooth and easy where is the obstacle here and here replied catherine striking one hand on her forehead and the other on her breast in whichever place the soul lives in my soul and in my heart i'm convinced i'm wrong that's very strange i cannot make it out it's my secret but if you will not mock at me i'll explain it i can't do it distinctly but i'll give you a feeling of how i feel she seated herself by me again her countenance grew sadder and graver and her clasped hands trembled nelly do you never dream queer dreams she said suddenly after some minutes reflection yes now and then i answered and so do i i've dreamt in my life dreams that have stayed with me ever after and changed my ideas they've gone through and through me like wine through water and altered the color of my mind and this is one i'm going to tell it but take care not to smile at any part of it oh don't miss catherine i cried we're dismal enough without conjuring up ghosts and visions to perplex us come come be merry and like yourself look at little hareton he's dreaming nothing dreary how sweetly he smiles in his sleep yes and how sweetly his father curses in his solitude you remember him i dare say when he was just such another as that chubby thing nearly as young and innocent however nelly i shall oblige you to listen it's not long and i've no power to be merry tonight i won't hear it i won't hear it i repeated hastily i was superstitious about dreams then and am still and catherine had an unusual gloom in her aspect that made me dread something from which i might shape a prophecy and foresee a fearful catastrophe she was vexed but she did not proceed apparently taking up another subject she recommenced in a short time if i were in heaven nelly i should be extremely miserable because you are not fit to go there i answered all sinners would be miserable in heaven but it is not for that i dreamt once that i was there i tell you i won't talk into your dreams miss catherine i'll go to bed i interrupted again she laughed and held me down for i made a motion to leave my chair and this is nothing cried she i was only going to say that heaven did not seem to be my home and i broke my heart with weeping to come back to earth and the angels were so angry that they flung me out into the middle of the heath on the top of wuthering heights where i woke sobbing for joy that will do to explain my secret as well as the other i've no more business to marry edgar linton than i have to be in heaven and if the wicked man in there had not brought heathcliff so low i shouldn't have thought of it it would degrade me to marry heathcliff now so he shall never know how i love him and that not because he's handsome nelly but because he's more myself than i am whatever our souls are made of his and mine are the same and linton's is as different as a moonbeam from lightning or frost from fire ere this speech ended i became sensible of heathcliff's presence having noticed a slight movement i turned my head and saw him rise from the bench and steal out noiselessly he had listened till he heard catherine say it would degrade her to marry him and then he stayed to hear no further my companion sitting on the ground was prevented by the back of the settle from remarking on his presence or departure but i started and bade her hush why she asked gazing nervously round joseph is here i answered catching opportunely the roll of his cartwheels up the road 
and Heathcliff will come in with him. I'm not sure whether he will not at the door this moment. Oh, he couldn't overhear me at the door, said she. Give me Hareton while you get the supper, and when it is ready ask me to sup with you. I want to cheat my uncomfortable conscience, and be convinced that Heathcliff has no notion of these things. He has not, has he? He does not know what being in love is. I say no reason that he should not know as well as you, I returned, and if you are his choice, he'll be the most unfortunate creature that ever was born. As soon as you become Mrs. Linton, he loses friend and love and all. Have you considered how you'll bear the separation, and how he'll bear to be quite deserted in the world? Because, Miss Catherine— He quite deserted? We separated? She exclaimed with an accent of indignation. Who is to separate us, pray? They'll meet the fate of Milo. Not as long as I live, Ellen, for no mortal creature. Every Linton on the face of the earth might melt into nothing before I could consent to forsake Heathcliff. Oh, that's not what I intend. That's not what I mean. I shouldn't be Mrs. Linton were such a price demanded. He'll be as much to me as he has been all his lifetime. Edgar must shake off his antipathy, and tolerate him, at least. He will, when he learns my true feelings towards him. Nelly, I see now you think me a selfish wretch. But did it never strike you that if Heathcliff and I married, we should be beggars? Whereas, if I marry Linton, I can aid Heathcliff to rise, and place him out of my brother's power. With your husband's money, Miss Catherine, I asked, you'll find him not so pliable as you calculate upon, and though I'm hardly a judge, I think that's the worst motive you've given yet for being the wife of young Linton. It is not, retorted she. It is the best. The others were the satisfaction of my whims, and for Edgar's sake, too, to satisfy him. This is for the sake of one who comprehends in his person my feelings to Edgar and myself. I cannot express it, but surely you and everybody have a notion that there is, or should be, an existence of yours beyond you. What were the use of my creation, if I were entirely contained here? My great miseries in this world have been Heathcliff's miseries, and I watched and felt each from the beginning. My great thought in living is himself. If all else perished, and he remained, I should still continue to be. And if all else remained, and he were annihilated, the universe would turn to a mighty stranger. I should not seem a part of it. My love for Linton is like the foliage in the woods. Time will change it, I'm well aware, as winter changes the trees. My love for Heathcliff resembles the eternal rocks beneath, a source of little visible delight, but necessary. Nelly. I am Heathcliff. He's always, always in my mind, not as a pleasure, any more than I am always a pleasure to myself, but as my own being. So don't talk of our separation again. It is impracticable, and— She paused, and hid her face in the folds of my gown, but I jerked it forcibly away. I was out of patience with her fully. If I can make any sense of your nonsense, miss, I said— it only goes to convince me that you are ignorant of the duties you undertake in marrying, or else that you are a wicked, unprincipled girl. But trouble me with no more secrets. I'll not promise to keep them. You'll keep that? She asked eagerly. No, I'll not promise, I repeated. She was about to insist when the entrance of Joseph finished our conversation, and Catherine removed her seat to a corner and nursed Hareton, while I made the supper. After it was cooked, my fellow servant and I began to quarrel who should carry some to Mr. Hindley, and we didn't settle it till all was nearly cold. Then we came to the agreement that we would let him ask, if he wanted any, for we feared particularly to go into his presence when he had been some time alone. And how isn't that note come in for what the field be this time? What is he about? Good idle seat demanded the old man, looking round for Heathcliff. "'I'll call him,' I replied. "'He's in the barn, I've no doubt.' I went and called, but got no answer. On returning, I whispered to Catherine that he had heard a good part of what she had said, I was sure, and told how I saw him quit the kitchen just as she complained of her brother's conduct regarding him. She jumped up in a fine fright, flung Harriton on to the settle, and ran to seek for her friend herself.' 
not taking leisure to consider why she was so flurried or how her talk would have affected him. She was absent such a while that Joseph proposed we should wait no longer. He cunningly conjectured they were staying away in order to avoid hearing his protracted blessing. They were... Ill enough for any foul manners, he affirmed, and on their behalf he added that night a special prayer to the unusual quarter of an hour's supplication before meat, and would have tacked another to the end of the grace had not his young mistress broken in upon him with a hurried command that he must run down the road, and, wherever Heathcliff had rambled, find and make him re-enter directly. "'I want to speak to him, and I must, before I go upstairs,' she said. "'And the gate is open. He is somewhere out of hearing, for he would not reply, though I shouted at the top of the fold as loud as I could.' Joseph objected at first. She was too much in earnest, however, to suffer contradiction, and at last he placed his hat on his head and walked grumbling forth. Meantime, Catherine paced up and down the floor, exclaiming, "'I wonder where he is. I wonder where he can be. What did I say, Nelly? I've forgotten. Was he vexed at my bad humour this afternoon? Dear, tell me what I've said to grieve him. I do wish he'd come. I do wish he would.' "'What a noise for nothing!' I cried, though rather uneasy myself. "'What a trifle scares you! "'It's surely no great cause of alarm that Heathcliff should take a moonlight saunter on the moors, "'or even lie too sulky to speak to us in the hayloft. "'I'll engage he's lurking there. See if I don't ferret him out.' "'I departed to renew my search. "'Its result was disappointment, and Joseph's quest ended the same. "'Yon lad gets war and war observed he on re-entering. "'He's left a gate at full swing, and Mrs. Pony has trodden down two rigs of corn, and plotted through right over into the meadow. Handsome diver, the maestro will play the devil to morn, and he'll do well. His patience it's sailing with such careless, awful craters. Patience it's sailing, he is. But you'll not be so, Alice.' Ye see, all on ye. Ye are to drive him out of his head for note. Have you found Heathcliff, you ass? interrupted Catherine. Have you been looking for him as I ordered? I should more lick a look for the horse, he replied. It'll be to more sense, but I can look for not a horse nor a man on a neat like this, as black as the chimbley. "'and Heathcliff's known to chap to come at ma whistle. "'Happen he'll be less hard of hearing we ye.' "'It was a very dark evening for summer. "'The clouds appeared inclined to thunder, "'and I said we had better all sit down. "'The approaching rain would be certain to bring him home without further trouble. "'However, Catherine would not be persuaded into tranquillity. She kept wandering to and fro from the gate to the door in a state of agitation which permitted no repose, and at length took up a permanent situation on one side of the wall near the road, where, heedless of my expostulations and the growling thunder and the great drops that began to plash around her, she remained, calling at intervals and then listening and then crying outright. She beat Harriton or any child at a good passionate fit of crying. About midnight... While we still sat up, the storm came rattling over the heights in a full fury. There was a violent wind, as well as thunder, and either one or the other split a tree off at the corner of the building. A huge bough fell across the roof and knocked down a portion of the east chimney stack, sending a clatter of stones and soot into the kitchen fire. We thought a bolt had fallen in the middle of us, and Joseph swung on to his knees, beseeching the Lord to remember the patriarchs Noah and Lot, and as in former times, spare the righteous, though he smote the ungodly. I felt some sentiment that it must be a judgment on us also. The Jonah, in my mind, was Mr. Earnshaw, and I shook the handle of his den that I might ascertain if he were yet living. He replied audibly enough, in a fashion which made my companion vociferate more clamorously than before, that a wide distinction might be drawn between saints like himself and sinners like his master— but the uproar passed away in twenty minutes, leaving us all unharmed, excepting Cathy, who got thoroughly drenched for her obstinacy in refusing to take shelter, and standing bonnetless and shawlless to catch as much water as she could with her hair and clothes. She came in and lay down on the settle, all soaked as she was, 
turning her face to the back and putting her hands before it. "'Well, miss!' I exclaimed, touching her shoulder. "'You are not bent on getting your death, are you? "'Do you know what o'clock it is? "'Half past twelve. "'Come, come to bed. "'There's no use waiting any longer on that foolish boy. "'He'll be gone to Gimmerton, and he'll stay there now. "'He guesses we shouldn't wait for him till this late hour. "'At least he guesses that only Mr. Hindley would be up, "'and he'd rather avoid having the door opened by the master.' "'Nay, nay, he's known at Gimmerton,' said Joseph. "'He's never wonder but he's at the bottom of a bog hoil. "'This visitation warrant for nought, and I would have ye to look out, miss. "'Ya more be to next. Thank heaven for all. "'All works together for good to them as is chosen and picked out from the rubbish. "'Yo know what the scripture says.' and he began quoting several texts, referring us to chapters and verses where we might find them. I, having vainly begged the willful girl to rise and remove her wet things, left him preaching and her shivering, and betook myself to bed with little Hereton, who slept as fast as if everyone had been sleeping round him. I heard Joseph read on a while afterwards, then I distinguished his slow step on the ladder, and then I dropped asleep. Coming down somewhat later than usual, I saw, by the sunbeams piercing the chinks of the shutters, Miss Catherine still seated near the fireplace. The house door was ajar, too. Light entered from its unclosed windows. Hindley had come out, and stood on the kitchen hearth, haggard and drowsy. "'What ails you, Cathy?' he was saying when I entered. "'You look as dismal as a drowned whelp. Why are you so damp and pale, child?' "'I've been wet.' she answered reluctantly. And I'm cold, that's all. Oh, she is naughty, I cried, perceiving the master to be tolerably sober. She got steeped in the shower of yesterday evening, and there she has sat the night through, and I couldn't prevail on her to stir. Mr. Earnshaw stared at us in surprise. The night through, he repeated. What kept her up? Not fear of thunder, surely. That was over hours since. Neither of us wished to mention Heathcliff's absence as long as we could conceal it, so I replied I didn't know how she took it into her head to sit up, and she said nothing. The morning was fresh and cool. I threw back the lattice, and presently the room filled with sweet scents from the garden. But Catherine called peevishly to me. Ellen, shut the window! I'm starving! And her teeth chattered as she shrank closer to the almost extinguished embers. She's ill! said Hindley, taking her wrist. I suppose that's the reason she would not go to bed. Damn it! I don't want to be troubled with more sickness here. What took you into the rain? Running after the lads, as usual. Croaked Joseph, catching an opportunity from our hesitation to thrust in his evil tongue. If I were you, maister, I'd just slam the boards in their faces, all on them, gentle and simple. Never a day you at your off, but young Carl Linton comes sneaking hither, and Miss Nelly shows a fine lass. Shows it's watching for ye at the kitchen, and as ye're in at one door, he's out at t'other, and then, where grand lady goes a courting of her side, it's bonny behaviour lurking among the fields after twelve at the night with the foul, fleesome devil of a gypsy. Heathcliff, they think I'm blind, but I'm no note out of sight. I seed young Linton both coming and going, and I'd seed ya. Directing his discourse to me. You're good for note, slatternly witch. Nip up and bolt into the house, the minute ye are heard the maester's horse fit clutter up the road. Silence, eavesdropper, cried Catherine. "'None of your insolence before me. "'Edgar Linton came yesterday by chance, Hindley, "'and it was I who told him to be off, "'because I knew you would not like to have met him as you were.' "'You lie, Cathy, no doubt,' answered her brother. "'And you are a confounded simpleton. "'But never mind Linton at present. "'Tell me, were you not with Heathcliff last night? "'Speak the truth now. "'You need not be afraid of harming him, "'though I hate him as much as ever. "'He did me a good turn a short time since.' That will make my conscience tender of breaking his neck. 
To prevent it, I shall send him about his business this very morning. And after he's gone, I'd advise you all to look sharp. I shall only have the more humour for you. I never saw Heathcliff last night, answered Catherine, beginning to sob bitterly. And if you do turn him out of doors, I'll go with him. But perhaps you'll never have an opportunity. Perhaps he's gone. Here she burst into uncontrollable grief, and the remainder of her words were inarticulate. Hindley lavished on her a torrent of scornful abuse, and bade her get to her room immediately, or she shouldn't cry for nothing. I obliged her to obey, and I shall never forget what a scene she acted when we reached her chamber. It terrified me. I thought she was going mad, and I begged Joseph to run for the doctor. It proved the commencement of delirium. Mr. Kenneth, as soon as he saw her, pronounced her dangerously ill. She had a fever. He bled her, and he told me to let her live on whey and water gruel, and take care she did not throw herself downstairs or out of the window. And then he left, for he had enough to do in the parish, where two or three miles was the ordinary distance between cottage and cottage. Though I cannot say I made a gentle nurse, and Joseph and the master were no better, and though our patient was as wearisome and headstrong as a patient could be, she weathered it through. Old Mrs. Linton paid us several visits, to be sure, and set things to rights, and scolded and ordered us all, and when Catherine was convalescent she insisted on conveying her to Thrushcross Grange, for which deliverance we were very grateful. But the poor dame had reason to repent her kindness. She and her husband both took the fever, and died within a few days of each other. Our young lady returned to us saucier and more passionate, and haughtier than ever, Heathcliff had never been heard of since the evening of the thunderstorm, and, one day, I had the misfortune, when she had provoked me exceedingly, to lay the blame of his disappearance on her, where indeed it belonged, as she well knew. From that period, for several months, she ceased to hold any communication with me, save in the relation of a mere servant. Joseph fell under a ban also. He would speak his mind and lecture her all the same as if she were a little girl, and she esteemed herself a woman." and our mistress, and thought that her recent illness gave her a claim to be treated with consideration. Then the doctor had said that she would not bear crossing much. She ought to have her own way, and it was nothing less than murder in her eyes for any one to presume to stand up and contradict her. From Mr. Earnshaw and his companions she kept aloof, and, tutored by Kenneth, and serious threats of a fit that often attended her rages, her brother allowed her whatever she pleased to demand, and generally avoided aggravating her fiery temper. He was rather too indulgent in humouring her caprices, not from affection, but from pride. He wished earnestly to see her bring honour to the family by an alliance with the Lintons, and as long as she let him alone she might trample on us like slaves, for aught he cared. Edgar Linton, as multitudes have been before, and will be after him, was infatuated— and believed himself the happiest man alive on the day he led her to Gimmerton Chapel, three years subsequent to his father's death. Much against my inclination, I was persuaded to leave Wuthering Heights and accompany her here. Little Hareton was nearly five years old, and I had just begun to teach him his letters. We made a sad parting, but Catherine's tears were more powerful than ours, when I refused to go, and when she found her entreaties did not move me, she went lamenting to her husband and brother. The former offered me munificent wages. The latter ordered me to pack up. He wanted no woman in the house, he said, now that there was no mistress. And as to Hareton, the curate should take him in hand by and by. And so I had but one choice left, to do as I was ordered. I told the master he got rid of all decent people, only to run to ruin a little faster— I kissed Hareton, said goodbye, and since then he has been a stranger, and it's very queer to think it, but I've no doubt he has completely forgotten all about Ellen Dean, and that he was ever more than all the world to her, and she to him. At this point of the housekeeper's story, she chanced to glance towards the timepiece over the chimney, and was in amazement on seeing the minute hand measure half past one. She would not hear of staying a second longer. In truth, I felt rather disposed to defer the sequel of her narrative myself. And now that she has vanished to her rest, and I have meditated for another hour or two, I shall summon courage to go also, in spite of aching laziness of head and limbs.
Chapter Ten of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. A charming introduction to a hermit's life. Four weeks torture, tossing, and sickness. Oh, these bleak winds and bitter northern skies, and impassable roads and dilatory country surgeons, and oh, this dearth of the human physiognomy, and worse than all, the terrible intimation of Kenneth that I need not expect to be out of doors till spring. <sighs> Mr. Heathcliff has just honoured me with a call. About seven days ago he sent me a brace of grouse, the last of the season. Scoundrel! He is not altogether guiltless in this illness of mine, and that I had a great mind to tell him. But alas, how could I offend a man who was charitable enough to sit at my bedside a good hour, and talk on some subject other than pills and draughts, blisters and leeches? This is quite an easy interval. I am too weak to read, yet I feel as if I could enjoy something interesting. Why not have up Mrs. Dean to finish her tale? I can recollect its chief incidents, as far as she had gone. Yes, I remember her hero had run off, and never been heard of for three years, and the heroine was married. I'll ring. She'll be delighted to find me capable of talking cheerfully. Mrs. Dean came. It wants twenty minutes, sir, to taking the medicine. She commenced. Away, away with it, I replied. I desire to have... The doctor says you must drop the powders. With all my heart. Don't interrupt me. Come and take your seat here. Keep your finger from that bitter phalanx of vials. Draw your knitting out of your pocket. That will do. Now, continue the history of Mr. Heathcliff, from where you left off, to the present day. Did he finish his education on the continent, and come back a gentleman? Or did he get a sizer's place at college, or escape to America, and earn honours by drawing blood from his foster country, or make a fortune more promptly on the English highways? He may have done a little in all these vocations, Mr. Lockwood, but I couldn't give my word for any. I stated before that I didn't know how he gained his money, neither am I aware of the means he took to raise his mind from the savage ignorance into which it was sunk. But, with your leave, I'll proceed in my own fashion, if you think it will amuse and not weary you. Are you feeling better this morning? Much. That's good news. I got Miss Catherine and myself to Thrushcross Grange, and, to my agreeable disappointment, she behaved infinitely better than I dared to expect. She seemed almost over-fond of Mr. Linton, and even to his sister she showed plenty of affection. They were both very attentive to her comfort, certainly. It was not the thorn bending to the honeysuckles, but the honeysuckles embracing the thorn. There were no mutual concessions. One stood erect, the others yielded. And who can be ill-natured and bad-tempered when they encounter neither opposition nor indifference? I observed that Mr. Edgar had a deep-rooted fear of ruffling her humour. He concealed it from her, but if ever he heard me answer sharply, or saw any other servant grow cloudy at some imperious order of hers, he would show his trouble by a frown of displeasure that never darkened on his own account. He many a time spoke sternly to me about my pertness, and averred that the stab of a knife could not inflict a worse pang than he suffered at seeing his lady vexed. Not to grieve a kind master, I learned to be less touchy, and, for the space of half a year, the gunpowder lay as harmless as sand, because no fire came near to explode it. Catherine had seasons of gloom and silence now and then. They were respected with sympathising silence by her husband, who ascribed them to an alteration in her constitution, produced by her perilous illness, as she was never subject to depression of spirits before. The return of sunshine was welcomed by answering sunshine from him. I believe I may assert that they were really in possession of deep and growing happiness. It ended. Well, we must be for ourselves in the long run. The mild and generous are only more justly selfish than the domineering, and it ended when circumstances caused each to feel that the one's interest was not the chief consideration in the other's thoughts. On a mellow evening in September, I was coming from the garden with a heavy basket of apples, which I had been gathering. It had got dusk, and the moon looked over the high wall of the court, causing undefined shadows to lurk in the corners of the numerous projecting portions of the building. I sat my burden on the house steps by the kitchen door, and lingered to rest, and drew in a few more breaths of the soft, sweet air. My eyes were on the moon, and my back to the entrance, when I heard a voice behind me say, Nelly, is that you? It was a deep voice, 
and foreign in tone, yet there was something in the manner of producing my name which made it sound familiar. I turned about to discover who spoke, fearfully, for the doors were shut, and I had seen nobody on approaching the steps. Something stirred in the porch, and, moving nearer, I distinguished a tall man dressed in dark clothes, with dark face and hair. He leant against the side, and held his fingers on the latch as if intending to open for himself. Who can it be? I thought. Mr. Earnshaw? Oh no, the voice has no resemblance to his. I have waited here an hour, he resumed, while I continued staring. And the whole of that time all round has been as still as death. I dared not enter. You do not know me? Look, I'm not a stranger. A ray fell on his features. The cheeks were sallow, and half covered with black whiskers, the brows lowering, the eyes deep-set and singular. I remembered the eyes. What? I cried, uncertain whether to regard him as a worldly visitor, and I raised my hands in amazement. What? You come back? Is it really you? Is it? Yes, Heathcliff. He replied, glancing from me up to the windows, which reflected a score of glittering moons, but showed no lights from within. Are they at home? Where is she? Nelly, you are not glad. You needn't be so disturbed. Is she here? Speak. I want to have one word with her, your mistress. Go and say some person from Gimmerton desires to see her. How will she take it? I exclaimed. What will she do? The surprise bewilders me. It will put her out of her head. And you are Heathcliff, but altered. Nay, there's no comprehending it. Have you been for a soldier? Go and carry my message, he interrupted impatiently. I'm in hell till you do. He lifted the latch, and I entered, but when I got to the parlour where Mr. and Mrs. Linton were, I could not persuade myself to proceed. At length I resolved on making an excuse to ask if they would have the candles lighted, and I opened the door. They sat together in a window whose lattice lay back against the wall and displayed, beyond the garden trees and the wild green park, the valley of Gimmerton, with a long line of mist winding nearly to its top. For very soon after you pass the chapel, as you may have noticed, the sow that runs from the marshes joins a beck which follows the bend of the glen. Wuthering heights rose above this silvery vapour, but our old house was invisible. It rather dips down on the other side. Both the room and its occupants, and the scene they gazed on, looked wondrously peaceful. I shrank reluctantly from performing my errand, and was actually going away, leaving it unsaid, after having put my question about the candles, when a sense of my folly compelled me to return, and mutter, "'A person from Gimmerton wishes to see you, ma'am.' "'What does he want?' asked Mrs. Lenton. "'I did not question him,' I answered. "'Well, close the curtains, Nellie,' she said. "'And bring up tea. I'll be back again directly.' She quitted the apartment. Mr. Edgar inquired carelessly who it was. "'Someone mistress does not expect,' I replied. "'That Heathcliff, you recollect him, sir, who used to live at Mr. Earnshaw's.' "'What? The gypsy? The ploughboy?' he cried. "'Why did you not say so, Catherine?' "'Hush! You must not call him by those names, Muster,' I said." She'd be sadly grieved to hear you. She was nearly heartbroken when he ran off. I guess his return will make a jubilee to her. Mr. Linton walked to a window on the other side of the room that overlooked the court. He unfastened it and leant out. I suppose they were below, for he exclaimed quickly, Don't stand there, love. Bring the person in, if it be anyone particular. Ere long I heard the click of the latch, and Catherine flew upstairs, breathless and wild, too excited to show gladness. Indeed, by her face you would rather have surmised an awful calamity. "'Oh, Edgar! Edgar!' she panted, flinging her arms round his neck. "'Oh, Edgar, darling! Heathcliff's come back! He is!' And she tightened her embrace to a squeeze. "'Well, well,' cried her husband crossly. "'Don't strangle me for that!' He never struck me as such a marvellous treasure. There's no need to be frantic. I know you didn't like him, she answered, repressing a little intensity of her delight. Yet, for my sake, you must be friends now. Shall I tell him to come up? Here, he said. Into the parlour. Where else? she asked. He looked vexed, and suggested the kitchen as a more suitable place for him. 
Mrs. Linton eyed him with a droll expression, half angry, half laughing at his fastidiousness. No, she added, after a while. I cannot sit in the kitchen. Set two tables here, Ellen, one for your master and Miss Isabella, being gentry, the other for Heathcliff and myself, being of the lower orders. Will that please you, dear? Or must I have a fire lighted elsewhere? If so, give directions. I'll run down and secure my guest. I'm afraid the joy is too great to be real. She was about to dart off again, but Edgar arrested her. You bid him step up, he said, addressing me. And, Catherine, try to be glad without being absurd. The whole household need not witness the sight of your welcoming a runaway servant as a brother. I descended and found Heathcliff waiting under the porch, evidently anticipating an invitation to enter. He followed my guidance without waste of words, and I ushered him into the presence of the master and mistress, whose flushed cheeks betrayed signs of warm talking. But the ladies glowed with another feeling when her friend appeared at the door. She sprang forward, took both his hands, and led him to Linton, and then she seized Linton's reluctant fingers and crushed them into his. Now fully revealed by the fire and candlelight, I was amazed more than ever to behold the transformation of Heathcliff. He had grown a tall, athletic, well-formed man, beside whom my master seemed quite slender and youth-like. His upright carriage suggested the idea of his having been in the army. His countenance was much older in expression and decision of feature than Mr. Linton's. It looked intelligent, and retained no marks of former degradation. A half-civilised ferocity lurked yet in the depressed brows and eyes full of black fire, but it was subdued, and his manner was even dignified, quite divested of roughness, though stern for grace. My master's surprise equalled or exceeded mine. He remained for a minute at a loss how to address the ploughboy, as he had called him. Heathcliff dropped his slight hand, and stood looking at him coolly till he chose to speak. "'Sit down, sir,' he said at length. "'Mrs. Linton, recalling old times, would have me give you a cordial reception. And of course I am gratified when anything occurs to please her.' "'And I also,' answered Heathcliff, "'especially if it be anything in which I have a part. I shall stay an hour or two willingly.' He took a seat opposite Catherine, who kept her gaze fixed on him as if she feared he would vanish were she to remove it. He did not wish to raise his to her often. A quick glance now and then sufficed. But it flashed back, each time more confidently, the undisguised delight he drank from hers. They were too much absorbed in their mutual joy to suffer embarrassment. Not so Mr. Edgar. He grew pale with pure annoyance. A feeling that reached its climax when his lady rose and, stepping across the rug, seized Heathcliff's hands again, and laughed like one beside herself. "'I shall think it a dream tomorrow,' she cried. "'I shall not be able to believe that I have seen, and touched, and spoken to you once more. And yet, cruel Heathcliff, you don't deserve this welcome. To be absent and silent for three years, and never to think of me!' "'A little more than you have thought of me,' he murmured. I heard of your marriage, Cathy, not long since, and while waiting in the yard below I meditated this plan, just to have one glimpse of your face, a stare of surprise, perhaps, and pretended pleasure, afterwards settle my score with Hindley, and then prevent the law by doing execution on myself. Your welcome has put these ideas out of my mind, but beware of meeting me with another aspect next time. Nay, you'll not drive me off again. You were really sorry for me, were you? Well, there was cause. I've fought through a bitter life since I last heard your voice, and you must forgive me, for I struggled only for you. Catherine, unless we are to have cold tea, please come to the table, interrupted Linton, striving to preserve his ordinary tone and a due measure of politeness. Mr. Heathcliff will have a long walk, wherever he may lodge tonight, and I'm thirsty. She took her post before the urn, and Miss Isabella came, summoned by the bell. Then, having handed the chairs forward, I left the room. The meal hardly endured ten minutes. Catherine's cup was never filled. She could neither eat nor drink. Edgar had made a slop in his saucer, and scarcely swallowed a mouthful. Their guest did not protract his stay that evening above an hour longer. I asked, as he departed, if he went to Gimmerton. No, to Wuthering Heights, he answered. 
Mr. Earnshaw invited me when I called this morning. Mr. Earnshaw invited him, and he called on Mr. Earnshaw. I pondered this sentence painfully after he was gone. Is he turning out a bit of a hypocrite, and coming to the country to work mischief under a cloak? I mused. I had a presentiment in the bottom of my heart that he had better have remained away. About the middle of the night I was awakened from my first nap by Mrs. Linton gliding into my chamber, taking a seat on my bedside and pulling me by the hair to rouse me. "'I cannot rest, Ellen,' she said by way of apology, "'and I want some living creature to keep me company in my happiness. Edgar is sulky, because I am glad of a thing that does not interest him. He refuses to open his mouth, except to utter pettish, silly speeches, and he affirmed I was cruel and selfish for wishing to talk when he was so sick and sleepy. He always contrives to be sick at the least cross. I gave a few sentences of commendation to Heathcliff, and he— either for a headache or a pang of envy, began to cry. So I got up and left him. What use is it praising Heathcliff to him? I answered. As lads they had an aversion to each other, and Heathcliff would hate just as much to hear him praised. It's human nature. Let Mr. Linton alone about him, unless you would like an open quarrel between them. But does it not show great weakness? pursued she. I'm not envious. I never feel hurt at the brightness of Isabella's yellow hair, and the whiteness of her skin, at her dainty elegance, and the fondness all the family exhibit for her. Even you, Nelly, if we have a dispute sometimes, you back Isabella at once, and I yield like a foolish mother. I call her a darling and flatter her into a good temper. It pleases her brother to see us cordial, and that pleases me. But they are very much alike. They are spoiled children and fancy the world was made for their accommodation. And though I humour both, I think a smart chastisement might improve them all the same. "'You're mistaken, Mrs. Linton,' said I. "'They humour you. I know what there would be to do if they did not. You can well afford to indulge their passing whims as long as their business is to anticipate all your desires. You may, however, fall out, at last, over something of equal consequence to both sides, and then, those you term weak are very capable of being as obstinate as you. And then we shall fight to the death, shan't we, Nelly? She returned, laughing. No, I tell you, I have such faith in Linton's love that I believe I might kill him, and he wouldn't wish to retaliate. I advised her to value him the more for his affection. I do, she answered. But he needn't resort to whining for trifles. It is childish. And instead of melting into tears because I said that Heathcliff was now worthy of anyone's regard, and it would honour the first gentleman in the country to be his friend, he ought to have said it for me, in being delighted from sympathy. He must get accustomed to him, and he may as well like him, considering how Heathcliff has reason to object to him. I'm sure he behaved excellently. What do you think of his going to Wuthering Heights? I inquired. He is reformed in every respect, apparently, quite a Christian, offering the right hand of fellowship to his enemies all around. He explained it, she replied. I wonder as much as you. He said he called to gather information concerning me from you, supposing you resided there still, and Joseph told Hindley, who came out and fell to questioning him, of what he had been doing, and how he had been living, and finally desired him to walk in. There were some persons sitting at cards. Heathcliff joined them. My brother lost some money to him, and finding him plentifully supplied, he requested that he would come again in the evening, to which he consented. Hindley is too reckless to select his acquaintance prudently. He doesn't trouble himself to reflect on the causes he might have for mistrusting one whom he has basely injured. But Heathcliff affirms his principal reason for resuming a connection with his ancient persecutor is a wish to install himself in quarters at walking distance from the Grange, and an attachment to the house where we live together and likewise a hope that I shall have more opportunities of seeing him there than I could have if he settled in Gimmerton. He means to offer liberal payment for permission to lodge at the Heights, and doubtless my brother's covetousness will prompt him to accept the terms. He was always greedy, though what he grasps with one hand he flings away with the other. "'It's a nice place for a young man to fix his dwelling in,' said I. "'Have you no fear of the consequences, Mrs. Linton?' "'None for my friend,' she replied. "'His strong head will keep him from danger. 
a little for Hinley, but he can't be made morally worse than he is, and I stand between him and bodily harm. The event of this evening has reconciled me to God and humanity. I had risen in angry rebellion against Providence. Oh, I've endured very, very bitter misery, Nelly. If that creature knew how bitter, he'd be ashamed to cloud its removal with idle petulance. It was kindness for him which induced me to bear it alone. Had I expressed the agony I frequently felt, he would have been taught to long for its alleviation as ardently as I. However, it's over, and I'll take no revenge on his folly. I can afford to suffer anything hereafter. Should the meanest thing alive slap me on the cheek, I'd not only turn the other, but I'd ask pardon for provoking it. And, as a proof, I'll go make my peace with Edgar instantly. Good night. I'm an angel. In this self-complacent conviction she departed, and the success of her fulfilled resolution was obvious on the morrow. Mr. Linton had not only abjured his peevishness, though his spirits seemed still subdued by Catherine's exuberance of vivacity, but he ventured no objection to her taking Isabella with her to Wuthering Heights in the afternoon, and she rewarded him with such a summer of sweetness and affection in return as made the house a paradise for several days, both master and servants profiting from the perpetual sunshine. Heathcliff, Mr. Heathcliff, I should say in future, used the liberty of visiting at Thrushcross Grange cautiously at first, he seemed estimating how far its owner would bear his intrusion. Catherine also deemed it judicious to moderate her expressions of pleasure in receiving him, and he gradually established his right to be expected. He retained a great deal of the reserve for which his boyhood was remarkable, and that served to repress all startling demonstrations of feeling. My master's uneasiness experienced a lull, and further circumstances diverted it into another channel for a space. His new source of trouble sprang from the not-anticipated misfortune of Isabella Linton evincing a sudden and irresistible attraction towards the tolerated guest. She was at that time a charming young lady of eighteen, infantile in manners, though possessed of keen wit, keen feelings, and a keen temper too, if irritated. Her brother, who loved her tenderly, was appalled at this fantastic preference. Leaving aside the degradation of an alliance with a nameless man, and the possible fact that his property, in default of heirs male, might pass into such a one's power, he had sense to comprehend Heathcliff's disposition. To know that, though his exterior was altered, his mind was unchangeable and unchanged. And he dreaded that mind. It revolted him. He shrank forebodingly from the idea of committing Isabella to its keeping. He would have recoiled still more had he been aware that her attachment rose unsolicited, and was bestowed where it awakened no reciprocation of sentiment. For the minute he discovered its existence, he laid the blame on Heathcliff's deliberate designing. We had all remarked, during some time, that Miss Linton fretted and pined over something. She grew cross and wearisome, snapping at and teasing Catherine continually, at the imminent risk of exhausting her limited patience. We excused her, to a certain extent, on the plea of ill health. She was dwindling and fading before our eyes. But one day, when she had been peculiarly wayward, rejecting her breakfast, complaining that the servants did not do what she told them, that the mistress would allow her to be nothing in the house, and Edgar neglected her, that she had caught a cold with the doors being left open, and we let the parlour fire go out on purpose to vex her, with a hundred yet more frivolous accusations, Mrs. Linton peremptorily insisted that she should get to bed, and, having scolded her heartily, threatened to send for the doctor. Mention of Kenneth caused her to exclaim instantly that her health was perfect, and it was only Catherine's harshness which made her unhappy. "'How can you say I am harsh, you naughty fondling?' cried the mistress, amazed at the unreasonable assertion. "'You are surely losing your reason. When have I been harsh, tell me?' "'Yesterday,' sobbed Isabella. "'And now?' "'Yesterday?' said her sister-in-law. "'On what occasion?' "'In our walk along the moor. You told me to ramble where I pleased while you sauntered on with Mr. Heathcliff. And <laughs> that's your notion of harshness, said Catherine, laughing. It was no hint that your company was superfluous. We didn't care whether you kept with us or not. I merely thought Heathcliff's talk would have nothing entertaining for your ears. Oh, no, wept the young lady. You wished me away because you knew I liked to be there. Is she sane? 
asked Mrs. Linton, appealing to me. I'll repeat our conversation, word for word, Isabella, and you point out any charm it could have had for you. I don't mind the conversation, she answered. I wanted to be with... Well, said Catherine, perceiving her hesitate to complete the sentence. With him, and I won't be always sent off, she continued, kindling up. You are a dog in the manger, Cathy, and desire no one to be loved but yourself. You are an impertinent little monkey, exclaimed Mrs. Linton in surprise. But I'll not believe this idiocy. It is impossible that you can covet the admiration of Heathcliff, that you consider him an agreeable person. I hope I have misunderstood you, Isabella. No, you have not, said the infatuated girl. I love him more than ever you loved Edgar, and he might love me if you would let him. I wouldn't be you for a kingdom, then, Catherine declared emphatically, and she seemed to speak sincerely. Nellie, help me to convince her of her madness. Tell her what Heathcliff is, an unreclaimed creature, without refinement, without cultivation, an arid wilderness of firs and windstone. I'd as soon put that little canary into the park on a winter's day as recommend you to bestow your heart on him. It is deplorable ignorance of his character, child, and nothing else, which makes that dream enter your head. Pray don't imagine that he conceals depths of benevolence and affection beneath a stern exterior. He's not a rough diamond, a pearl containing oyster of a rustic. He's a fierce, pitiless, wolfish man. I never say to him, let this or that enemy alone, because it would be ungenerous or cruel to harm them. I say, let them alone, because I should hate them to be wronged. And he'd crush you like a sparrow's egg, Isabella, if he found you a troublesome charge. I know he couldn't love a Linton. And yet he'd be quite capable of marrying your fortune and expectations. Avarice is growing with him a besetting sin. There's my picture, and I'm his friend, so much so that had he thought seriously to catch you, I should perhaps have held my tongue and let you fall into his trap. Mrs. Linton regarded her sister-in-law with indignation. For shame, for shame, she repeated angrily. You are worse than twenty foes, you poisonous friend. Ah, you won't believe me then, said Catherine. You think I speak from wicked selfishness? I'm certain you do, retorted Isabella. And I shudder at you. Good, cried the other. Try for yourself if that be your spirit. I have done, and yield the argument to your saucy insolence. And I must suffer for her egotism, she sobbed as Mrs. Linton left the room. All, all is against me. She has blighted my single consolation. But she uttered falsehoods, didn't she? Mr. Heathcliff is not a fiend. He has an honourable soul and a true one, or how could he remember her? "'Banish him from your thoughts, miss,' I said. "'He's a bird of bad omen, no mate for you.' Mrs. Linton spoke strongly, and yet I can't contradict her. She is better acquainted with his heart than I, or any one besides, and she never would represent him as worse than he is. Honest people don't hide their deeds. How has he been living? How has he got rich? Why is he staying at Wuthering Heights, the house of a man whom he abhors? They say Mr. Earnshaw is worse and worse since he came.' They sit up all night together continually, and Hindley has been borrowing money on his land, and does nothing but play and drink. I heard only a week ago it was Joseph who told me. I met him at Gimmerton. Nelly, he said, we hees a crown of quest to know at our folks. One on them, sir, a getting his finger cut off with hoarding to other for sticking his sound like a calf. That's maister, you know, that's so a up a going to the grand sizes. He's known fear to the bench of judges, nor to Paul, nor Peter, nor John, nor Matthew, nor none on them, not he. He fair likes, he longs to set his brazen face again him. And yon bonny lad, Heathcliff, ye mind, he's a rare un. He can go and laugh as well as anybody at a right devil's gist. Does he never see no to his fine living among us? When he goes to the Grange, this is the way, aunt. Up at sundown, dice, brandy, cloy shutters, and candlelight till next day at noon. Then, 
to foil the gang's banning and raving to his chamber, making decent folks dig their fingers in their lugs for very shame, on the nave where ye can keep his brass, and eat, and sleep, and off to his neighbours to gossip with the wife, he cause, he tells him Catherine how her father's gold runs into his pocket, and her father's son gallops down to Broad Road while he flees afore to open to Pikes. Now, Miss Linton, Joseph is an old rascal, but no liar, and if his account of Heathcliff's conduct be true, you would never think of desiring such a husband, would you? You are leagued with the rest, Ellen, she replied. I'll not listen to your slanders. What malevolence you must have to wish to convince me that there is no happiness in the world. Whether she would have got over this fancy if left to herself, or persevered in nursing it perpetually, I cannot say. She had little time to reflect. The day after, there was a justice meeting at the next town. My master was obliged to attend, and Mr. Heathcliff, aware of his absence, called rather earlier than usual. Catherine and Isabella were sitting in the library, on hostile terms, but silent, the latter alarmed at her recent indiscretion, and the disclosure she had made of her secret feelings in a transient fit of passion, the former, on mature consideration, really offended with her companion, and, if she laughed again at her pertness, inclined to make it no laughing matter to her. She did laugh as she saw Heathcliff pass the window. I was sweeping the hearth, and I noticed a mischievous smile on her lips. Isabella, absorbed in her meditations, or a book, remained till the door opened, and it was too late to attempt an escape, which she would gladly have done had it been practicable. "'Come in, that's right!' exclaimed the mistress gaily, pulling a chair to the fire. "'Here are two people sadly in need of a third to thaw the ice between them, and you are the very one we should both of us choose. Heathcliff, I'm proud to show you, at last, somebody that dotes on you more than myself.' I expect you to feel flattered. Nay, it's not Nelly. Don't look at her. My poor little sister-in-law is breaking her heart by mere contemplation of your physical and moral beauty. It lies in your own power to be Edgar's brother. No, no, Isabella, you shan't run off. She continued, arresting with feigned playfulness the confounded girl, who had risen indignantly. We were quarrelling like cats about you, Heathcliff and I was fairly beaten in protestations of devotion and admiration. And, moreover, I was informed that if I would but have the manners to stand aside, my rival, as she will have herself to be, would shoot a shaft into your soul that would fix you for ever, and send my image into eternal oblivion. "'Catherine,' said Isabella, calling up her dignity, and disdaining to struggle from the tight grasp that held her, I thank you to adhere to the truth and not slander me, even in joke. Mr. Heathcliff, be kind enough to bid this friend of yours release me. She forgets that you and I are not intimate acquaintances, and what amuses her is painful to me beyond expression. As the guest answered nothing, but took his seat, and looked thoroughly indifferent what sentiments she cherished concerning him, she turned and whispered an earnest appeal for liberty to her tormentor. By no means, cried Mrs. Linton in answer. I won't be named a dog in the manger again. You shall stay. Now then, Heathcliff, why don't you evince satisfaction at my pleasant news? Isabella swears that the love Edgar has for me is nothing to that she entertains for you. I'm sure she made some speech of the kind. Did she not, Ellen? And she has fasted ever since the day before yesterday's walk, from sorrow and rage that I dispatched her out of your society, under the idea of its being unacceptable. "'I think you belie her,' said Heathcliff, twisting his chair to face them. "'She wishes to be out of my society now, at any rate.' And he stared hard at the object of discourse, as one might do at a strange, repulsive animal. A centipede from the Indies, for instance, which curiosity leads one to examine in spite of the aversion it raises. The poor thing couldn't bear that. She grew white and red in rapid succession, and, while the tears beaded her lashes, bent the strength of her small fingers to loosen the firm clutch of Catherine, and perceiving that as fast as she raised one finger off her arm, another closed down, and she could not remove the whole together, she began to make use of her nails, and their sharpness presently ornamented the detainers with crescents of red. "'There's a tigress!' exclaimed Mrs. Linton, setting her free, and shaking her hand with pain. "'Be gone, for God's sake, and hide your vixen face! How foolish to reveal those talents to him!' Can't you fancy the conclusions he'll draw? 
Look, Heathcliff, there are instruments that will do execution. You must beware of your eyes. I'd wrench them off her fingers if they ever menaced me, he answered brutally when the door had closed after her. But what did you mean by teasing the creature in that manner, Cathy? You were not speaking the truth, were you? I assure you I was, she returned. She has been dying for your sake several weeks, and raving about you this morning, and pouring forth a deluge of abuse, because I represented your failings in a plain light, for the purpose of mitigating her adoration. But don't notice it further. I wish to punish her sauciness, that's all. I like her too well, my dear Heathcliff, to let you absolutely seize and devour her up. And I like her too ill to attempt it, said he, except in a very ghoulish fashion. You'd hear of odd things if I lived alone with that mawkish waxen face. The most ordinary would be painting on its white the colors of the rainbow, and turning the blue eyes black every day or two. They detestably resemble Linton's. Delectably, observed Catherine. They are dove's eyes, angels. She's her brother's heir, is she not? he asked, after a brief silence. I should be sorry to think so returned his companion. Half a dozen nephews shall erase her title, please heaven. Abstract your mind from the subject at present. You are too prone to covet your neighbour's goods. Remember this neighbour's goods are mine. If they were mine, they would be none the less that, said Heathcliff. But though Isabella Linton may be silly, she is scarcely mad, and in short we'll dismiss the matter, as you advise. From their tongues they did dismiss it and Catherine, probably, from her thoughts. The other, I felt certain, recalled it often in the course of the evening. I saw him smile to himself, grin, rather, and lapse into ominous musing whenever Mrs. Linton had occasion to be absent from the apartment. I determined to watch his movements, my heart invariably cleaved to the master's, in preference to Catherine's side. With reason, I imagined, for he was kind and trustful and honourable, and she— she could not be called opposite, yet she seemed to allow herself such wide latitude that I had little faith in her principles, and still less sympathy for her feelings. I wanted something to happen which might have the effect of freeing both Wuthering Heights and the Grange of Mr. Heathcliff quietly, leaving us as we had been prior to his advent. His visits were a continual nightmare to me, and, I suspected, to my master also. His abode at the Heights was an oppression past explaining— I felt that God had forsaken the stray sheep there to its own wicked wanderings, and an evil beast prowled between it and the fold, waiting his time to spring and destroy. End of chapter 10